So he devised an intriguing thought experiment. He used a horse to represent the motion of the Earth. If a rider dropped a ball while standing still, the ball would, of course, fall straight down, landing beside the horse. But what would happen if the same rider dropped the ball with the horse at full gallop? In Galileo's experiment, the forward motion of the horse would be communicated to the ball through the rider's hand. As the ball dropped, it would continue to move forward and would still land beside the horse, just as it had done when the horse stood still. To Galileo, when the horse and the ball shared the same motion, it was as if the motion did not exist. If the Earth were moving, could we be carried along with it and not be conscious of its motion. There is a sort of a principle of relativity where if you're sort of moving with the Earth, everything shares the same motion. Not only is the Earth moving, but I'm sharing that motion as well. And therefore, it is all hidden. It was probably the first really great thought experiment in, in physics. He, he, in fact, he was so confident of the result, he never even bothered to do the experiment to show it was right. Despite his troubles with the church, Galileo was still well supported by the Medicis. He moved closer to his daughter, to a hillside villa outside of Florence. Florence is surrounded by these hills, and Arcetri, like the others, was a place where the wealthy families of Florence would have their villas. There were also normal farmhouses, there were convents, it was uh, relatively difficult to get into town. And uh, when the daughter of Galileo was in a convent nearby down there, when she also found for the father a location next to the convent where he had fields, he had olive oil. The daughter was also telling him that it was producing wine, but that he should not drink too much wine. Maria Celeste is extraordinary in every way. She, she lives in this cloister. She is cut off from the world, and yet she has her hands in everything. The real estate market, the foods, the small favors, the laundry. She never did lose her sense of being a dutiful Italian daughter. The aging Galileo constantly complained of terrible ailments. I find this very thin, cold air in Florence <laughs> to be most cruel to my head and to all the rest of my body. Constipation, discharge of blood, cold. Over the last three months, left me in such a state of despair. I'm practically confined to my room. No, oh, to my bed. Without the benefit of either sleep or rest. Somehow, Galileo's every passing need, his ailments, his interests, were known to his daughter behind her convent walls. Most illustrious Lord Father, Please do not forget the grave condition you are in and have a little more love for yourself than for the garden. In this season of Lent, make this one sacrifice, if only for me. Deprive yourself for a time of the pleasure of the garden. Sacrifice and exhaustion 
were conditions Sister Maria Celeste knew firsthand. The convent where Virginia became Maria Celeste was a particularly poor convent. Being a convent of the poor Clares, it was, of course, committed to poverty. That was their way of life, their chosen way of life. So they expected to have little to eat and to be cold in the winter and to experience harshness in, in every day's every moment. Sire, I assure you that I am never vexed by boredom, but sooner by the hunger, caused, I believe, by the coldness of my stomach, which does not get the full complement of sleep it requires. I only tell you this to excuse myself for the haphazard appearance of my letter, as I was compelled to put down and then take up my pen again more than once before I could complete it. Maria Celeste is a bright personality. She's in a dark place. There's at least one nun who tries to kill herself in this convent. And yet, Maria Celeste always has a way of seeing the higher purpose, the higher good, that never fails her. Such graceful submission to the ways of the faith was not a path Galileo would follow. He could never emulate his daughter's obedience to the church, even under the watchful eyes of the Inquisition. The church taught that all heavenly bodies were unchanging and pristine. But Galileo's telescope continued to reveal a cosmos quite unlike the officially accepted truth. Even on the bright surface of the sun itself, Galileo observed dark blemishes, which he named sunspots. He could not have known that the spots were actually magnetic storms, but his descriptions of them were remarkably accurate. Sunspots are generated and decay in longer and shorter periods. Some condense and others greatly expand from day to day. They change their shapes and some are most irregular. They must be enormous in bulk, being either on the sun or very close to it. Galileo gets into an argument with a German Jesuit mathematician named Christoph Scheiner about the nature of sunspots. The German argues that these spots are in fact little satellites that go around the sun, whereas Galileo argues that these spots are really either on the surface of the sun or very close to it, and that they're sort of like, perhaps, clouds. If the Jesuit were right, and the spots were independent satellites, then the surface of the sun would remain pristine, as doctrine demanded. Sunspots have a very irregular appearance, and if you can bring that out visually, then the argument that these are satellites of the sun becomes absurd. And so Galileo very carefully planned the publication of his letters of sunspots. They're all oriented properly so that you can see them from one day to the next being sort of born on the sun and dying there. All of a sudden in the middle of the sun there is, appears on one day a little spot and the next day it grows and then it grows some more and then it slowly goes off the edge. Clearly, there are spots on the sun that are so irregularly shaped that they can't possibly be satellites. There is a visual essay in which you have uninterrupted views of sunspots. Galileo produced a series of intricate engravings recording the daily changes of his sunspots. The continuous movements of the blemishes suggested that the sun might actually rotate on its axis.
the visual evidence is accepted by both Copernicans and people who still believe that the Earth is the center of the universe, but it is the interpretation of that, of that evidence. And more and more and more, you see these conservative astronomers then stretching. Because if you can say that these are satellites of the sun, you can still say that the sun is perfect. Galileo knew that his adversaries were wrong. It didn't matter if the Jesuit mathematician wished the sun to be unblemished. Galileo had demonstrated real spots on the surface of the real sun.